Hello and welcome to episode six of Mind Wars Forum. Today we're going to be talking journalism in the coal fields with Ken Ward Jr. Ken Ward is an award-winning journalist and he has been bucking the trend of the way the region is portrayed in the media for a very long time, going all the way back to the Hatfield-McCoy feud and T.C. Crawford. The region has often been portrayed in a negative light, in a stereotypical way, and even local journalism, such as the Logan Banner, these things were created specifically to promote coal industry and promote extraction industry. So you have national media that has been portraying the region in a stereotypical light. You have local media that has been portraying a pro-industry version of events. Ken Ward has been bucking that trend. So uh, it's my pleasure to be talking with him today. And remember, if you want to support the museum and this work, click on a link below or follow a link below and you can go on to our website, become a museum member, you can buy merchandise from us, and support the work we're doing. So we hope that you enjoyed this episode of Mind Wars Forum. Hi Ken, how are you? And uh, welcome to Mind Wars Forum. I'm doing well, thanks for having me, ha thanks for having me on, I hope you're doing well. Yeah, yeah, staying busy, and I know that you're in an incredibly busy time right now with uh, everything that you've got going on, so I, I'm really appreciative of you taking the time right now to sit down and talk with me. And, uh, you know, today we're talking journalism. And journalism, of course, has played a big role in the way this region is portrayed, the way the coal fields are portrayed, and how the history, in fact, in, in some ways has been thought of uh, in the region. So that's why I thought you were a perfect person to talk to in regards to that. So um, just get right into it. What got you into journalism in the first place? Um, well, let's see. I guess I, it, all, it started when I was 11, and mm -hmm. uh, I got a job delivering the Cumberland, Maryland Times News. Mm -hmm. uh, you were supposed to be 12 to have a paper out that my dad thought I needed to uh, get to work. So uh, <laughs> I started delivering the paper, and a uh, um, a uh, very kind lady who ran the little satellite Cumberland Times office in my hometown, Kaiser, uh, was nice enough to kind of promote me through the ranks. So I was, uh, I moved from being an, uh, a newspaper carrier to cleaning the office yeah. and uh, uh, doing things like that. And, and, and so that's how I got started. And I, and I really actually, it, it was, it, it was a weird sort of turn. I, um, uh, I was always a big reader and I liked to write, but I actually at one point in college was uh, thinking I would be a high school band director. Um, and, but I, uh, when I got to Morgantown at West Virginia University, I uh, was looking for some things to do and get involved in. And I thought I would try the student newspaper. And at that time, the Daily Athenaeum was in a kind of torn up old house uh, just off of campus. And I, um, wandered in there and it looked like everybody in there was really having a hell of a good time uh, putting out a newspaper. So it seemed fun and I tried it and uh, it, it just seemed like a lot more fun than going to class most of the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the DA, uh, I didn't know that you had uh, worked for, uh, for them. Um, yeah, I, uh, uh, I was a reporter and then a news editor and then I uh, was managing editor and um, uh, really learned a lot about um, uh, journalism and a lot about life uh, working there. Met a lot of uh, a lot of really good friends, people I'm still friends with now. Uh, working there, I mean, it, and and I also think that I think a, a good independent student newspaper is really a vital part of of a university campus. You know, you, you need uh, <clears throat> you need that uh, to to uh, speak for the students and sometimes for the faculty. Uh, against the administration uh, if they're doing things that they shouldn't be doing. Um, it's a great, uh, being kind of a watchdog over campus uh, student government is also a great training for being a watchdog over regular government. So, I mean, the, the DA was a huge part of, of, of my life, certainly for the time I was in Wilmington. Yeah, and, and the experience at WVU apparently helped shape you uh, for journalism down the road. And of course, we share one thing in common from our experiences at WVU. We both had Ron Lewis as uh, a professor. I studied under him for my dissertation. And anything uh, that you took away from Ron Lewis's classes, because so much of what you report on deals with themes that he teaches and writes about. 
Uh, well, I mean, I think certainly I, I was very fortunate at, uh, in college to have a couple of professors that really had a huge influence, and, and Dr. Lewis was one um, that, uh, I mean, I, I wasn't a, a history major and PhD student of his, but, but and, and in fact, when he was, when he was kind of semi-retiring and they had a, an event for him, I was just overwhelmed, but I, I, among the students that were asked to come and talk about him and his influence on them, I was the only non-history major PhD that they asked to come and talk. Yeah, um, I remember that. And, uh, I mean, you know, the, the, you know, his books had a huge influence on me and just the, you know, the, the uh, understanding, uh, I mean, journalists too often, you know, we get hung up on what's happening now and what's happening now and, and, and don't go back and look at well, why is this happening and who was pulling the strings. And, and I mean, it, it's, a, it's a, a worn out cliche, I guess, but it is true. If you don't understand the past, you're just going to repeat the mistakes of it. And that's, you know, part of what I've tried to bring to my journalism has been, um, uh, for example, when we're talking about this is the public policy path that West Virginia should take. Well, let's look and see if we've taken that path before and how did that turn out for us? And, and so I think that that history is very important. And, and you know, a, a bit of a kind of a lighter note about, you know, the learning from Ron Lewis is um, that uh, it gave me a real appreciation for the importance of, of what we put in the newspaper because I, I never really understood that so much of uh, history that gets written later draws on what's in the newspaper. So, you know, if, if you know, what, what, what some newspaper from, uh, newspaper guy from New York was writing about Blair Mountain was going to, uh, influence not only the way people thought of it at the time, but it was going to be a record that historians were going to use later. So it, it would, sometimes it, it felt a little bit scary and overwhelming to think that gosh, you know, in, in 50 years, somebody's going to be reading this story I wrote trying to assemble the history of these events. And, and it makes you want to be really reflect and make sure you, you get it right. And, and, and I also, I mean, I also think that um, uh, too often at universities, um, uh, the, uh, the accolades can go to people that are doing lots of uh, high tech fancy research that's bringing right. in a lot of money right. uh, and not so much to people that are doing the kind of research that Ron does. And I think also that um, uh, teaching isn't nearly as uh, appreciated by universities as it ought to be. Right. Um, but I think, you know, you and I know the, the, the region, uh, the Appalachian region now is populated by really brilliant scholars like yourself that, that, uh, came up from Ron Lewis, and and that scholarship is giving us all a better understanding of where we came from. So maybe we can figure out how to get West Virginia and Appalachia to a better place. And and so what you know what higher role, what, what higher public services that have been been teaching the way that that Ron has taught so many of us to to think about West Virginia's past. Yeah, his legacy as a teacher is every bit as expansive, maybe even more so than what he's done. Uh, uh, as a scholar, and of course, his you know his accomplishments as a scholar are pretty much unparalleled for Appalachian well, scholars in the last forty years or so. And also, like that, you mentioned looking at the past to understand where policy is going in the future. I know you've been covering natural gas, for example, in the last couple of years, and you can see so many parallels between what's happening with natural gas now and what was initially happening with the coal industry over a century ago. Sure. I mean, I, I think, you know, when we, uh, when we were working with, with ProPublica and writing about natural gas, one of the things that I really wanted to do was look at what the natural gas industry's promoters were promising West Virginia uh, and compare it to what the coal industry's promoters did and continue to promise us. And, uh, and I thought, I mean, I, I felt like at times when I was working on the story, I was channeling things that, that, that Ron talked about in class and, and and he's written about it, uh, and that I learned from him. You know, going back and looking at the time we were we were digging into the natural gas industry, uh, there was uh, you know it was when the, the public school teachers and other employees were on strike, and there was a lot of talk of maybe you know, we should increase taxes on that industry to fund better schools or uh, things like that. And and it what and, a concept. 
Yeah, and it, and and it, you know, it just it went back to you know Governor Marlin, and mm-hmm. well, gosh, let's tax the coal industry so we can have better roads and better water systems and better schools, and gosh, well, we can't possibly have that, and they ran him out of town on a rail. So you know, I mean, bringing that sort of uh, bringing that sort of history into modern day public policy debates, I think, is is just absolutely critical and something the media doesn't do nearly enough of. Yeah, I agree 100 percent. And so you came down to the Gazette. When did you come down uh, to work for the Gazette initially? Um, I interned at the Gazette uh, in the summer of 1989, which is the summer the mine workers were on strike against Pittston Coal. Yeah, Pittston. Uh, and uh, uh, for some reason, they somebody thought it was a good, Don Marsh, who was the editor at the time, thought it was a good idea for me to go help cover the strike. And I, so I got to spend the summer driving around Southern West Virginia and Southwestern Virginia uh, with a photographer talking to coal miners on picket lines. And, you know, um, that, uh, that really kind of, that's, if it, it was among the things that really sealed the deal for me that, that, you know, journalism was, it was just so much fun talking and talking to coal miners and learning from them about their work and their lives and, you know, the joke in the newsroom at the time was that, well, we can send that, we can send that intern from WVU, send that kid to the picket line, because, you know, if there's any trouble, he's not on the company health plan, and we won't have to worry about that. <laughs> but for me, it was just, it was just a, 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 an incredibly rich experience that I, I think about it every day, um, the things I've learned that summer. Yeah, I didn't know that you'd covered Pittston. So, yeah, that would have been quite an education. Don't go back and look at the stories, because I didn't know what the heck I was doing. Uh-huh. <laughs> Well, it's uh, that uh, I, I can't imagine what you would learn from there that you wouldn't learn in the classroom, and and, and uh, how that would be. And that was one of the last of the major strikes uh, of the battles between the, you know the union and one of the the final catalysts that really took the union you know in its kind of terminal decline, unfortunately, in the region. Well, and I think that's you know that's another example of you know a lot of what gets written about coal and about the mine workers today is often not infused with the right history and context of pit of their fights with Pittston and Massey and the mm-hmm. fight for the health and retirement funds in the first place. And, you know, we see those, those fights for preserving pensions and health care for retired coal miners continuing. And those really that, they, that those fights had their roots with the, the Massey strike and the Pittston strike. Yeah. It's never ending, never ending struggle that they've had to fight uh, from the very beginning. Now you worked with Paul Nyden Many years, uh, our museum gave uh, posthumously gave uh, Paul Nyden a red bandana award, and uh, his fortunately his son was there to uh, accept it. And Paul, you know, has this long legacy in, in the area for holding industry accountable. Any anything you learned from Paul Nyden? Any Paul Nyden stories uh, that, that oh, you would like to share? I know well, you know, the rest I mean, of the time talking I mean, about that. I mean, any anything that I have been able to to do is uh, any journalism that I've done about the coal industry. I've I've really only been standing on Paul's shoulders because he really wrote the book about it and understood it so well and um, brought such a great uh, sense of values and the worth of of workers to to those stories and and was just so totally fearless. I mean, Paul was my my dear friend and mentor. Um, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, Paul, uh, one story about Paul is, is, you know, Paul was such an accomplished guy, you know, he had a PhD from mm-hmm. Columbia in sociology dissertation about the reform movement and the mine workers. And I spent the summer of 89, I was over at Paul's house three, four nights a week for dinner and down at the bar having a beer with him and, and was just trying to soak up knowledge from him about coal because he was writing a lot about it then too and um, uh, when I went back to Morgantown I took a history of coal class from Dr. Lewis and and he had this great reading list of various coal books and I read them all and I wanted more and I went to him after class and said hey, can you suggest some other things I should should read and he said uh, well aren't you that aren't you the guy that worked down at the Gazette over the summer and I said yeah and he said well have you read Paul Nyden's dissertation and I said, Paul Nyden wrote a dissertation? Yeah. He said, yeah. And I, the whole summer, I thought I'd gotten to know Paul, and uh, he never mentioned that he had a PhD or that it was in the subject that we were talking about. 
or that, uh, you know, he had written what really is probably the greatest single thing that's ever been written about the coal industry, you know, and, but that's Paul is, you know, because Paul, one of the things that made him such a great reporter was he didn't talk about himself. He tried to always talk. He always tried to get other people to talk about themselves and, and to listen. And, and, and I, and I think that that, uh, I, I think Paul shared a couple of things with, with Ron Lewis. One is that, um, that, that sense of mentoring and, and teaching. And, you know, there, there are newsrooms around the country that are populated with investigative reporters that came up at the Gazette who uh, went to Sunday dinner at Paul's house and learned so much from Paul, just like there are, you know, uh, teachers and researchers and authors around the region that learned from Ron. And the other thing is that they, you know, you really had to pay attention to a Paul Niden story because uh, he didn't really believe in this like inverted pyramid style of AP reporting that, that, mm -hmm. that a lot of newspapers preached. So you had to kind of, you had to pay attention. And, and if you paid attention, uh, there'd be a payoff at the end. It was always a, a really good kind of kicker. Um, and uh, it took me a while to realize it, but that's kind of the way Ron Lewis lectured too. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if, if, uh, it, 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 if you, if you paid close attention, you saw humor and uh, you heard context, uh, but um, both of them expected of their students or their mentees, they expected, uh, they expected you to work at, work for it. You had to work for that, that knowledge. It wasn't just gonna whack you over the head, and, and I appreciated that approach. Yeah, and, and Paul, Paul was always really humble, never bragged on himself uh, anytime that I was ever around him. And, you know, if you make it to the top of Don Blankenship's hate list, uh, you, you know that you've accomplished something that, uh, <laughs> that goes beyond any kind of awards. So you, you eventually did Cole Tattoo. And, and I think a lot of people know you from Cole Tattoo. I know it's really where I first began following your stories is when I uh, found that blog. And... Tell me about that process. Where did that come from? And uh, what do you remember most from that? What do you take away from that experience? Um, you know, it's interesting because, uh, you know, a lot of people still kind of, I, I forget that that was something that brought a lot of people to some of our stories that might not have otherwise found them. Um, and I think that that speaks to, you know, there was a, there was a period of time where like blogs were the thing. And, you know, if, if, if you were going to get readers, you had to have a blog. And that's kind of what I did was, you know, okay, you know, there's a, we thought that there was an audience beyond West Virginia for West Virginia based on the ground coverage of what was happening with the coal industry. So we thought the blog was a way to, to capture that. And I also thought that it was kind of an unleashing way to be able to write because you could write in a different voice. It wasn't expected that you were going to be this dry, boring newspaper style. And, and so I enjoyed that a lot. And, um, uh, you know, a lot of folks, a lot of folks have a, a weird reaction to that. that they thought it was um, editorializing or uh, crossing some imaginary line about what, you know, reporters are or aren't supposed to do. Um, but, you know, I, I enjoyed it a lot. Um, but I forget because we really, when I started uh, in with the Natural Gas Series in 2018, we kind of let the blog, we made a conscious decision that we're not going to do the blog this mm -hmm. year. And then I continued with a different project in 2019 and we decided again. So the blog is just kind of, I, I, I don't know, I, I don't think, now especially since I've left the paper, I don't think it's, I, I don't, I don't really have any plans to resume it. And I, and I wonder if blogs are kind of like not done anymore, I guess. Right. I don't know. But I think that the, 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 the one thing that was kind of wild that was actually very discouraging to me was that we had a comment section and you know comment sections are just you know don't read the comments right but um i was i was i was determined that we could do an intelligent comment section if if, if it was moderated uh not to like throw out people that i disagreed with but to make people show their work mm -hmm. and so we set we set up some rules like you know if you start spouting off uh facts you have to show where you got them give us a link or a citation or, you know, it's basically footnote your comments. Um, and uh, boy, a lot of people just really didn't like that. 
and were right. unwilling to engage in that way. And uh, what I found most discouraging about it was that um, there were some really interesting uh, industry people. And I found out who some of them were later. They were posting under assumed names um, uh, who were engineers or financial people who knew a lot about coal and like how, like where the pressure points that will help you make money or ensure that you lose money with mm -hmm. coal. And they were posting on coal tattoo and they were citing to their work and, you know, all, and it was really interesting stuff. And I learned a lot from them. Um, now, of course, there were some that just wanted to like bash President Obama uh, and move on. And, and you know, um, those folks ended up being kind of banned from the blog if they didn't, you know, show their work. But what was disappointing to me was a lot of folks um, from uh, the environmental community, the labor community, you know, so-called, you know, political progressives um, reacted the most negatively uh, to being asked to show their work as anybody. Uh, and and, and I, I just found that very disheartening that, that when, when a forum was provided where we were trying to level the playing field where everybody, everybody gets their say, but you have to show where you're getting your information, that, that the progressive community in West Virginia really didn't want to have that discussion that way. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I, 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 so it just, it, 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 it still bothers me that that, you know, that it, it kind of went down that way. Yeah. And a couple points on that. Uh, first of all, that's one of the things I loved about Cole Tattoo was that you could click on links that would show source material or would reference uh, former stories. And we could talk all day about the difference between online news versus the paper news. But that is one of the advantages of being online is that you can click on links that go back to older stories or go to charts uh, that enable you to, to really dig deeper into it. That's one of the things I was most appreciative of. And yeah, I have to agree with you on the, uh, the environmental side. Ideologically, I'm very much in support uh, of the environmental movement and what they stand for. But yeah, they're not without reproach with, uh, Sometimes not uh, fact-checking themselves as well as maybe they should. I remember when Soledad O'Brien did her documentary on the Marsh to Blair Mountain, the environmental community, they were the ones who did this big angry response to it that they uh, published online because it showed the perspective of a coal mining family and they thought that that was too, uh, <laughs> it was too beneficial to the coal industry. Uh, of course, <laughs> CNN can't win. Uh, they're either, uh, <laughs> it, people either call them the communist news network or on the progressive side, they're not progressive enough. But uh, I've, I've found that really interesting over the last few years as, as I became involved in, you know, in issues surrounding environmentalism. I've never really, I was never really an environmental activist, but with the Blair Mountain, you know, battle over, over the battlefield. Ooh. Of course, I'm dealing with environmental groups all the time, and, uh, and I kind of saw that from the outside coming in. So, yeah, that's. Well, uh, I mean, of course, I mean, of course, is I mean, is 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 you know that the the strategy of pitting one against the other, you know, it's 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 a time honored coal industry and other industry strategy of of, of you know, making everything into a jobs versus the environment, you know, coal miners mm -hmm. versus salamanders kind of nonsense, you know, um, and, and I think unfortunately it kind of works, but I mean, in, in this case, like what we, there were, there was one, one guy in particular who, uh, he kept posting the same sort of, uh, uh, really which, which were just kind of cheerleading comments on coal tattoo. And, and I would ask him to show where you got this information and he didn't want to do that. And he kind of reverted to, Instead, he didn't comment on my blog anymore. He commented on the Gazette website where mm -hmm. we didn't have those same kinds of rules. And the other thing I mentioned, I mean, one of the reasons I went with a blog was that at the time, the content management system that we were using at the Gazette, it was really difficult to link back to previous stories, let alone to like source material. Mm -hmm. And for me, like the, the advent of being able to put all those links into a news story was such a transparent act for journalism, you know, if you look at one of my stories that I write today, it's, it's just like full of links because I, I almost feel like every fact that I assert, I should link to and show people where I got it. Right. And um, I know when I consume journalism and 
I don't see those links. I get a little wary of the person who's producing that journalism that they're not showing their work to me. Yeah, it forces you to be honest. It forces you to be accurate. And, yeah. uh, and so you can't merely um, tout an ideological principle. Uh, you know, you, you have to, uh, because we all find out, I think, no matter what your beliefs are, you always run into facts that didn't support what you initially thought, or you find that things aren't as clear cut uh, as what you originally imagined. And I think your journalism has been an important part of that. So you're in an industry dominated place. I teach in an industry dominated place. What do you find is, is the most difficult thing about reporting uh, in a region uh, that, that, that is so much, you know, a lot of publications, I've talked about national publications, but like the Logan Banner, it was created as a pro industry publication. Uh, you go back to a lot of these small county publications, they were started to tout uh, the benefits of the industry, the benefits of industrialization. So kind of contradictory voices were often left out. So have you come across, what do you think is most difficult about that uh, in today's day and age? Well, I mean, I, you know, I, a couple things about the one that, thing that I would always say is, you know, um, the sorts of pressures that uh, people like me face in a place like West Virginia today, mm -hmm. um, you know, other parts, in other parts of the world, people who do investigative journalism, you know, they take you out and shoot you in the back of the head. So, you know, where they cut your head off. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, uh, we don't face, uh, at least yet in this America, we're not facing those sorts of things. Um, but uh, I think that um, trying to, uh, I, I think there's a, especially as the economic picture for local journalism has gotten more and more difficult, uh, the pressures to kind of cheerlead for the economy and cheerlead for local captains of industry has increased. Uh, and I think that that, I think it was always there, but it makes it harder and harder uh, to report honestly. And it, uh, it makes it harder to just do the work. Um, you know, there's a, the, in, 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 you know, there's, look, there's, in West Virginia, there's a lot of really bad journalism, a lot of good journalism, there's a lot of really bad journalism that just refuses to ask difficult questions of powerful people and powerful institutions. But, you know, I think of it as, um, I think of it this way, um, we all need like a best friend. So like when you're starting to do something stupid in your life, mm -hmm. uh, that best friend is the person who can say with all love to you, Ken, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? This is really a big mistake. What are you thinking? Um, and I think that local journalism organization uh, needs to be for its community sometimes uh, that best friend and say, hey, let's stop and slow down and take a look, and think about what we're doing. And so I think that's the important role. And I'll say the other thing is I think that it's, I think it's way more difficult to report local journalism in a community, in a, in a small community uh, and live there and work there and have your kids go to school there. And I mean, I live in Charleston. I mean, you know, I, I try not to be, to kind of over romanticize or dramatize my own place in West Virginia, because I, I, I you know, I live in a, I live in a city in West Virginia uh, and, um, Though I grew up in a small town where the dominant industry was a, was a paper mill uh, that exerted the same kind of force and influence in that community. You know, Henry Louis Gates, a uh, scholar at Harvard, is from the same hometown as me. And he writes very eloquently in his uh, memoir about that. But it's, it's, it's very difficult because um, if you work for the New York Times, you can parachute into Logan County, West Virginia, and write the sort of crap that New York Times reporters and others from big outlets often write when they land someplace like that. And then you're, you're, you know, you're out of there and you don't have to deal with the people you write about. Well, you know, if you live here and you work here, the chances that, you know, the, somebody that you're writing about is going to have a kid on your kid's soccer team or that when you go out for brunch uh, on Sunday with your wife, you're going to be sitting, seating at a, sit at a, a table across from the way from a person you wrote about, mm -hmm. or you're just going to run into them walking down the street. I mean, it makes you be more honest because, you know, all of those things I just mentioned have happened to me. Yeah. Uh, 
and, and so it, it, it forces you to be honest. Yeah, I love that you point that out because I, I write about this a little bit in, in my book that's coming out about how not just journalists, like say uh, mine inspectors uh, that live in those communities, you know, your kid plays for a little league ball team and, and the coach is a supervisor at the, at the mine site. Um, his wife is head over the cheerleading squad, yeah. you know, and, and those types of pressures can be applied in so many different ways that, you know, you don't need uh, the coal industry to actually take any kind of specific action because people are there to apply those social pressures that make it difficult to be honest and forthright and open and sometimes stifles that uh, honest conversation that we need. Right. Well, I, I know that you're, you're pressed for time here. Uh, so I do want to ask you before we uh, close up what you're working on now. I know you've got a really exciting new project going on in West Virginia. So I want you to talk about that for a minute. And tell well, me. I thought you'd never ask. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I uh, uh, left the, the Gazette Mail in February. Um, and in March, I started as a staff reporter at ProPublica, the nonprofit uh, investigative newsroom based in New York. Um, they are kind enough to let me continue to live and work in West Virginia. And I'm going to be covering West Virginia issues for ProPublica. Uh, we had a couple stories uh, just out about Governor Justice and his business empire kind of following through on stories that we've done about that and this. this he loved that story, didn't he? Yeah, this, yeah, this propensity that his, <laughs> you know, he seems to have to, his businesses have to get sued for not paying their bills. Um, uh, and, uh, but we're also, um, with Greg Moore, my longtime friend and former editor at the Gazette Mail, uh, we've launched uh, our own nonprofit uh, civic organization newsroom here in West Virginia. We're calling it Mountain State Spotlight. Um, and our goal is to do uh, to help West Virginians make the state a better place by giving them the journalism that they need. It's, we're going to follow in the Ned Shilton tradition of sustained outrage, and, uh, do accountability journalism, try to hold powerful institutions and people accountable in West Virginia. Uh, we're uh, working with uh, ProPublica and a group called the American Journalism Project and with a group called Report for America. Uh, our staff actually starts on June 1st. Uh, so as we're recording this, it's, it's a Friday and they're starting on Monday. So it's, today's kind of a big day. We're getting ready for our, our, our staff. We're going to have one of the largest newsrooms in West Virginia at our launch, and we're going to be, uh, aggressively fundraising and building this up. And, you know, with the state of newspaper economics today, uh, the, the newsrooms at places like the Gazette Mail and other newspapers in West Virginia are stretched incredibly thin. Uh, and a new business model is needed that, uh, in which readers and the community support the journalism with donations and contributions. Uh, and, uh, you know, we really, we're trying to build uh, another sort of civic organization that our community needs. Uh, you know, you think of the great civic organizations, libraries, and, uh, and the ballet, or the, the Clay Center in Charleston, and, you th and, and uh, really, uh, journalism is too important to be left to the to the market to decide if it succeeds, uh, and so we're working on this new model and uh, very excited about it. We've got a great team of uh, editors and reporters, um, and we're going to be launching uh, our full website in August with stories. Uh, but folks can go to Mountain State Spot Mountain State Spotlight org. Uh, and read some about who we are and what our mission is, and if and, and hopefully they'll support us. Uh, there's a donation link there, and also most importantly, um, uh, we have a we have a short questionnaire there. We believe very much that the community needs to tell us uh, what they want investigated, and that the community knows what kind of journalism it needs. And we hope West Virginians will help us investigate by filling out that form. Uh, and uh, we're just, uh, we're really excited about it. Yeah, uh, I think it's an incredible project, and I love the new model that you guys are going with. We're going to be providing a link below whenever Great. the video airs so that people Thank can you. visit it and they can go and donate, and I want to encourage all the viewers and our museum members to help support that project. When I think about your journalism, Ken, I, uh, believe it or not, I think about a verse from the Bible 
uh, and I don't know the exact verse, I'm no biblical scholar, but the, when Jesus was, you know, doing his ministry and uh, upsetting a lot of the powers that be, he referred to people that didn't uh, accept his doctrine as people with itching ears, uh, people that uh, <laughs> only, only want to go hear what they want to hear. And it's so easily for a journalism in, in this area to go report on the pumpkin festival and hurricane or, you know, do these nice feel-good stories, and it's much more difficult to really dig deep into the issues that impact our economy and our society. So I um, you know, wish you all the best uh, in your new Thank venture, you. and I hope that our membership and the public will support that. So thanks so much for joining uh, me. We've thanks had for a having great, me. great conversation, and um, I hope our members enjoy it. And um, take care, and I guess you're off to a Jim Justice press conference. That's uh, right. So, uh, mm -hmm. the good thing is he's late, uh, so yes. usually, so you have plenty of time to get there. So, yeah. thanks so much, Ken. I Thank you. It. Well, good to talk to you. Yes. Until next time.